Time for another board game review, and this time we have the game Undaunted Normandy. This was sent to me by Osprey Games, and is designed by David Thompson and Trevor Benjamin. Undaunted Normandy is a campaign-driven deck-building game of tactical World War II combat. Use your cards to seize the initiative, bolster your forces, or control your troops on the battlefield, but be warned. Every casualty on the field removes a card from your deck, limiting your options and leaving you at the mercy of your opponent. Let me show you how to play. In Undaunted Normandy, you play as either the Allies or the German forces in uh, the summer of 1944. You're in command of a rifle platoon striving across a series of missions to claim and hold key objectives. Each scenario will have a different landscape of tiles, which you will have to master in order to claim the objectives and gain advantageous positions. You'll be playing cards from your personal deck to control your units, but as casualties mount, you'll have to acquire new cards to reinforce your dwindling forces. Now, there's a scenario book. There are uh, 12 scenarios in all, and they all have different maps and also different uh, starting decks, uh, and they're all based off historical events. I'm just gonna show you the setup for the first mission. So play takes the form of a series of rounds during which both players will play cards to move their units, attack the opposing forces, and grab objectives. Each round consists of the following three phases. You first, you draw cards, then you determine initiative, and then you uh, do your player turns. Once the last phase has been completed, the round is over and the next round begins. Uh, this continues until a player has won. So, each of you has a starting deck determined by the scenario. You draw four cards to form a hand. Now this number up in the top left corner of the card is initiative. What you're gonna do to determine initiative is take one of the cards and place it face down. Then both of you reveal, and whoever has the higher initiative gets to go first. You take the initiative marker and flip it to your side. Now, if there is ever a tie and you have the same initiative, then whoever is currently holding the initiative marker keeps it. This is crucial. And then the cards that you use to choose initiative are discarded. Then whichever player has the initiative marker will play cards from their hand one at a time into a play area in front of them. Once they have no more cards in their hand that they can or wish to play, their turn is over. After that, the player without initiative will take their turn in the same way. You can't save cards in your hand for future rounds, and each card play can be used to do one of the following. You can either do one of the actions on the card, and perform it in full, or hunker down, return it to your supply. So let's go over uh, one of the actions, which is move. This says move one. You would move your rifleman A uh, up to one tile. Now, the tile you move on has to be scouted, and that's what these binocular icons are for. Um, so I couldn't move here, because there's no scout icon, but I could move my rifleman here. Another action you can do is guide. This will let you move any combat counter up to that many spaces. So this platoon guide, if you played him, uh, would let you move any tile one. Scouts let you do a scout action. In this case, you could move two. So the scout could go, let's say, one, two. And uh, each space he goes into, he's going to put a uh, scout token on. So that lets your other troops progress through those spaces. However, for each of those tokens you put on the board, you have to put these terrible Fog of War cards into your deck, which just kind of clog up. They don't do anything, so they clog up your deck. The later sniper cards you receive in later missions have a stalk action. This lets you move your co co uh, combat counter up to that many tiles, but the tiles you move on to don't have to be scouted in advance. Another action you can do is bolster. Bolster lets you take cards from your supply to add them to your deck. The platoon sergeant here uh, can bolster three, so you can take your pick. Maybe you could take a rifleman A, a rifleman B, and a scout A and you would put those in your discard pile. If the card has a specific squad you have to bolster, like 2B, then you can only do uh, B members. The platoon sergeant also has an ability called Command, where if you play that instead, you get to draw two cards, because uh, it says Command 2, and you can still play those cards on the same turn. Scouts have another action they can do called Conceal. What that does is you make the opponent take a Fog of War into their discard pile. Control is an action where, let's say Rifleman A is here. Uh, he can flip this scout tile over to its control side. If the enemy control token was here instead, then you would take their token and flip it to their scouted side. And then you control it. However, you can't control a tile if an enemy token is on that tile. But in this case, it's empty, so he can do that. 
Another action you can do with a card is inspire. Uh, if you inspire, what you do is you choose up to that many cards in your play area that you already played and add them back to your hand and they can be played again. So the C squad leader could take any uh, C card, any one C card you've played uh, and replay it. And the recon ability, what that lets you do is you can choose a fog of war card in your hand and remove it from the game. Then you can draw a card from your deck and play it as normal. This is a way to get rid of these terrible fog of war cards. Now, we don't have mortars in this map, but if we did, the target action will let you uh, place a target marker on a tile that is three or more tiles away from your mortar control com combat counter. So he could like put a tar uh, target there. However, if you ever move your mortar, you have to take this off the board. Now, those were all the movement and support actions, but the main meat of the combat is through attacking and suppressing. So with Rifleman A, uh, let's go over how attacking works. Uh, when you perform any of the actions above, take the following steps. So you choose here. So here's Rifleman A, and you're gonna choose a target for the attack. For attack or suppress, it can be any enemy combat counter on the board. Now let's say Rifleman A wanted to shoot uh, the enemy's Rifleman A. You have to first count up their total defense value. So if you look here, uh, the base defense of Rifleman A is four. So you would take four, and then you would add the cover bonus. Each tile has this little black shield. Uh, that is, so this one is one, so it would be five. Then you count how many tiles away uh, the attacking combat counter is from the defender, not including the tile. So in this case, it's one tile away. So the total defense of the Rifleman A is six. Then you roll dice equal to uh, the attack value. So he has an attack of one. Roll a dice. Ooh, it's a three, so that would be a miss. If the number is ever equal or greater to the total defense value, the attack is successful. Also, if you ever roll a zero, that's a crit. It always hits. Now let's say instead that Rifleman A rolled a seven. Then the attack is successful, and you've inflicted casualties on the selected unit. Your opponent must then find a card of the attacked combat counter's unit and remove it from the entire game. If possible, if they have a Rifleman A in their hand, First, it gets taken out of their hand. If they didn't have one in their hand, then they check their discard pile. If they don't have one in their discard pile, remove it from the deck. And if you don't have a card of that unit in your deck or anywhere, then finally the counter is removed from the board. Now the key here is that no matter how many dice you roll, like for example, the machine gunner would let you roll two dice. But even if you have multiple successes, you only ever remove one card after an attack. Having more dice just makes it greater odds for you to succeed. Another option for combat is suppression. Uh, instead of attacking, you would roll this many dice, uh, but instead of killing the unit, you would just suppress it and flip it over to this side. Now what happens is when a combat counter is suppressed, uh, that means it cannot perform actions. So if you play a right, if this, if the enemy played a rifleman A in the future, uh, instead of doing anything, you just flip this back up to the ready side, but you don't take the action. And another thing, uh, let's say Rifleman A was wiped off the board. If you ever played a Rifleman A back onto the field, it spawns wherever the spawn marker here tells you. So in this scenario, all units respawn on this tile for the German side. And on this tile, all the US units uh, spawn. But depending on the map, sometimes like A and B units might spawn on a, on a specific tile as opposed to others. There's also a blast action that the mortar can do. So if you have the target token on a tile and you use blast, you actually get to roll against every single enemy on that tile, including any of your own current counters. You would roll a separate dice attack against each combat counter and take the steps. Now those are all the actions you can take. Going back to fog of war cards, these are useless because they don't have any actions on them. You can still, however, use them as your initiative card when you're declaring initiative. And the only way to get rid of these, remember, is to do the recon action. And then instead of playing a card for one of the actions, you could also hunker it down. If you're like, I don't need this scout B anymore, you hunker down and you put it back in your supply. Now the scenario you're playing will give you a specific objective for your side, and it's usually either controlling objective points or pinning the enemy by removing all their riflemen. Remember I mentioned with a rifleman, you can control uh, a tile using an action. So if you manage to control uh, 
uh, a tile with a two on it, that means you get two objective points. In the first scenario, whoever controls five objective points uh, total uh, wins the game. So you're basically uh, maneuvering your troops and fighting for control of specific points. On the other hand, in regards to pinning enemies, if both sides are simultaneously pinned, meaning that they neither side has any riflemen on the board, then the game ends immediately, and whichever side has the most objective points controlled wins the game. And that's pretty much it. You uh, get more units, varied units, as you progress through the game, and different objectives and uh, different uh, commands and abilities are given to you. Uh, but that's all uh, detailed as you go through uh, each objective, as well as different starting decks, uh, different supplies, different victory conditions. It's all uh, detailed for you depending on the scenario. And that's the game. So I loved this game actually. I played through the entire campaign uh, and I, would, I am very excited to eventually go through and play it again uh, on the other side. I'm really surprised by how much I enjoyed it because to be completely honest, I looked at the theme and I was like, huh, historical World War II game, huh? Okay. But it's actually very engaging and fun and strategic. Yeah, it's pretty light and there's dice rolling, which I'm usually kind of eh about. But the maneuvering of units and the like sort of deck building aspect of the game is really, really fun. Uh, it almost reminds me of like a, like a Fire Emblem game in that respect. One thing that's really cool is that uh, each soldier has a distinct art and a name for uh, the soldier. Uh, that just makes, you know, each of your units feel like, you know, a real person, almost. There's clearly a lot of respect in this game for the historical events. Uh, the campaign book outlines the history of all the different missions in an interesting way, uh, and the missions all also feel very distinct as well. I also like the initiative system in this because it's clever. You have to sacrifice the card you you use, uh, so you have to keep that in mind. But also in this game, initiative is extremely important because if somebody manages to kill one of your units and it's in your hand, you have to just throw it out of the game and you lose that card. So going first can be crucial in combat. And the overall concept of the cards being soldiers of a specific type and getting removed from the game, there is this constant tension of like, okay, I'm losing more and more of this soldier, you know, and I'm, I'm adding more to my deck, but I'm running out of the supply. There's always that fun tension of how to like continue building your deck in a way to survive. So yeah, highly, highly recommended. I adored this game. I think it has a lot of replay value. Uh, you can play, you know, both sides. Uh, it's a great two-player game. Uh, it's elegant, it's easy to learn, it feels strategic. Overall, just a very pleasant surprise. I was not expecting to like this as much as I did. Um, it's just a fun as hell combat system uh, with with lots of fun decisions to make. And the, the, the variety in missions and uh, abilities and soldiers you get as you move on through the game is very satisfying. So. Highly recommended.